And so here we are at step three of how to install DGIS Reloaded for CR6 uh, on your machine. Step one, I used Mainsail OS to give you a kickstart into Clipper. I'll mention now you could equally use something called KIA UH and use that to install Clipper, Moonraker, Mainsail if you choose. It'll also allow you to say how many printers you want to try to control if you think your host machine is up to multiple printers. Um, I haven't gone there because Mainsail OS seemed a much lower bar of entry to getting Mainsail up and running. But if you did that, if you if you chose to go KIA UH, works equally well for step one. Step two would then be the same step. Doesn't matter really if your host is a Linux PC like mine downstairs or the Raspberry Pi we're preparing in this demonstration. It doesn't really matter at all what the host is It'll, as long as it's all running a Linux um, operating system of some sort, the instructions I gave you will work just fine. Though you may have to go and install Git first if it wasn't part of the installation. We were fortunate with Mainsail OS, there it was. So now I'm gonna show you how you get into the, um, the final stages of putting the display on board um, but here we are at the repository for version 128 of the Clipper component that we just installed. And as I've said on the tail of two repositories, they point to one another. So whatever version is the latest Clipper, you go ahead and install it. You can come back to the release notes and it will give you a link to the corresponding DWIN set. They almost must be a matched pair because the interface is implemented partly on one side and partly on the other side. They won't they can't be guaranteed to talk to each other if they haven't been developed to work together. And that's true of any DWIN set application from any source, whether you're talking Marlin, you know, Creality, Community Firmware, whatever it is. You have a touch screen on one side and the printer motherboard on the other side. The interface between the two is a collaboration between two computers, one inside your display and one inside your printer. They must be programmed with compatible firmwares in order to speak to each other. There's no standardized API between the two that, to which all interfaces conform. Just how it is. Simplest thing to do, scroll down to your assets, take the zip file, and download it. There'll always be a zip file for the DWIN set. It's also available through source code. You could go down there and open it up and find it and put it in, but you don't need to if that's uh, an issue for you. Just go ahead and take the, the zip. And when we look inside, there are always release notes. The DWIN set is gonna look a little different to you. I have all these bump files in here. They're there for me. They won't affect you. You're welcome to delete them if you want or just not unpack them, but they do no harm. They are there because when I open DJ's tools to modify the interface, this is the only way I can get the background graphic to appear in my tool so that I can put widgets, I can overlay them on the background graphics with precision because I can see the both at the same time. Um, so I leave them there. It reduces my workload. The bin files are the same three that you need to install on every DWIN. It says, uh, where's, where's my touch map? which graphic files am I using, which of the ICLs, and do I um, load any values, uh, defaults on power up into any of the fields. That's what those three things do. And then the ICL, this is where the graphics are stored for the tool. So the tool looks in there based on the show file bin contents whenever it's trying to display a button or an animation. Okay? But the bump files are not necessary. Now, that's a bare bones DWIN set. This file, one time DWIN set. I'm anticipating um, new adopters. New adopters are going to need to flash that and that at least once. If you're updating a previous installation, you don't have to update those anymore. Unless I say so, and I can't anticipate a reason why I would do so at the moment. This is the font. I changed the font so that the um, descenders are no longer being clipped like they are in the community firmware. And the config 
is very important because it tells it tells the bootloader where to load the graphics, what address to start from. And it's different from the community firmware. So these things are memorized by the display. If you've used them once, they stick unless you overwrite them. Uh, power off doesn't erase them. They stick in memory and you have to overwrite them to change them. So if you do flash back to the community firmware, you decide, don't like Clipper, I'm getting back to Marlin, you will need to find the T5L config file for Marlin for the community firmware and the font file for the community firmware and flash those again to your display. But you only have to do this one time. So copy these into their own DWIN set folder and flash them first and then go to the other or copy these into the DWIN set folder here. Whoop. Here. Just, just take these files and copy them. Not this folder, right? Copy the two files like that and then paste them in here if you like and then take this whole thing or this whole thing minus the bump files whatever you feel and put this dwin set folder into the root of the sd card that you're going to stick in your display all right and then go ahead and flash that to your display and you will have completed that part of step three so we put the card in the reader we power up the printer. Okay, there it is. Loads the three bin files. Takes a little longer with the ICL file. And that is complete now. That's a, that was with the basic no font file and no config file because I've already loaded those before. Now here I have a, a second DWIN display. It happens to be an external carrier. The SD card here is being, the micro SD card is placed directly into the, the display. So I have this printed out and cut away so I don't have to keep dismantling the hardware. To power this one up, I plug it into a USB power supply putting in the ICL files and with 4.5 it may end up with that colored screen at the end of the flash fear not it will be fine take the power off the display remove the card from the back power back up and there we are 4.0 beta is installed now this particular display is not connected to the printer right now so I'm not going to be able to interact with this one, but that one is, and I will interact with that one. So this PC happens to be right next to the printer, and the trailing wire in the left margin there. Right there is the Raspberry Pi that I have plugged in to the printer. That's our machine that we programmed up yesterday. On the mainsail interface, you always have access to restart firmware in the event that we've lost communications. So we push firmware restart. Clipper goes through its performance. It says, oh, there we go. Initializing, we're connected. So now when I go back to the printer, my stock display is exhibiting his home screen. I mentioned in the release notes, if you tap here takes you back to the boot screen. These buttons out of focus on the bottom here, thank you camera, are the reset. So you can also do a restart from there now, which it will. It, it took us three seconds to get back in here. Now it's doing the restart. There, it's printer ready again. So the restart button does work from here, but only after you have established communications with the host. So now we're on this display to control the printer. I can use the move screen, right? I can change filament. All my functionality is here. All from that display. And to get there, all I did was 
I flash this display here at step three and at step two we flash the printer there right with a, a card containing the clipper bin file and we prepared this Raspberry Pi that was our machine at step two yes those wires out there are going to uh, a vibration sensor that I didn't finish setting up. Right, and there is mainsail from which I can control the printer also. Okay, so now I'm going to call time on this video rather than let it drag out. But we do have one more activity to go through. It took three steps to get this thing installed. But hey, we, now we have to tailor it to your printer. The instructions and macros that I've um, embedded in, in these 11 files we've installed are for my machine, not yours. And for my workflow, not necessarily yours. You and I are going to go through those files together. I'll explain in the next video what each of these is, what curiosities maybe are in there as we browse through them, and help you figure out how you're going to adapt this now to your business, to your use of the printer. The least you need to do is to run a PID on both the nozzle and the bed. You can do both of those from the display. And then use the macros that I gave you for ABL. Run it cold, PLA, which is the 60 degree one, and PETCHI, which is the 80 degree one. Run those three ABLs in that order because I heat soak the bed before the ABL for about five minutes a shot. And it's awkward waiting for the 80 to come down to 60, it's much better, I think, to go from 60 to 80. So run them from cold, 60, and 80. They automatically save the configuration to printer.config, so you can look at the bottom of printer.config. After running each of those three macros, you will see it accumulating the ABLs. You can then go here to the height map function, because it'll have something to retrieve, and take a look at the shape of your bed and so on, see how it's working out. Right? Next video, coming soon, honestly, in a matter of days at most. Thanks for joining me on this journey. I'm really hoping that the community programming gurus, the, the Python experts, the Clipper experts, will contribute pull requests and discussions and issues to that forum so that as a community we can really sharpen this thing up and make it the new community firmware interface at least on the Clipper side. Talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.